All right. Yes, we are live. America's artistic legacy. I'm Paul Bass, and we have with us Professor Carroll. And this is the class on the America's artistic legacy. The session is new technologies and the gilded age. Going from the Pony Express, the Telegraph, changing communications in the mid 19th century. So let's get to it, Professor Carroll. Hello, and thanks Hi. for doing this today. Always my pleasure. Oh, Thank man. you for being there. I feel like there's a lot of ground to cover because this stuff is of interest to me, you know. So, you know, if I'm if I'm asking questions that seem like a a a fourth year old a fourth grade boy asking you questions about the Pony Express, I'm sorry, but it, in a sense, it is that guy. Well, aren't we all really? If we're honest with ourselves. Oh man, I'm telling you. But you, yeah, you made the point that it lasted only 18 months, and we don't even really think of that as how no. much of an icon it was, yet it was a fairly short period of time. You know, it was one of the greatest ideas. I always think if they could have just started it a few, you know, 25, 30 years earlier, think of the money they might have made. But it's so ingrained in our uh, popular Americana, the Pony Express, you know, we know what that, we know the icon, you know, the design, the term. Um, but it, it's a great example of something that is completely taken away by technology. Um, a different new technology and that story is going to be our story up to today from this point on I mean technologies have changed things all along but it took long longer you know um, I'm sure the wheel changed a lot of things you know we weren't there but um, it, it, and you know the fact that you're surprised that it was 18 months that is so common it's a, in our assignment for that unit I asked the kids or the grown-up students um, to go to like some friends at a party or in your class or some relatives and I ask and I always love doing this I used to do this with my students at the university and to so ask them about the Pony Express and see what they know about it people always know a little bit about it and then ask them when it was and ask how long did it last and you would not believe most of us will come up with very different answers than what the facts are. Most people will say, you know, they'll think it lasted 100 years or something or 80 years or because they can't imagine something that um, clear in our popular culture even today was such a tiny little short thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you talk. You also talk about Mark Twain and uh, American humor. What is American humor? Ha! Huh. I think it's American humor must be when you invest all that money to put together, you know, 400 ponies or horses, they weren't ponies, and build all those way stations and take all your investors or whatever and set up this incredible route that will get a letter there for ten, in 10 short days, right, from the Midwest to, you know, to, to San Francisco, and then along comes something called the Telegraph, and it does it instantly. That's probably uh, American humor, isn't it? Uh. And now what are you going to do, you know, except close shop? No, that's, that's kind of the downside of American humor, isn't it? Well, um, we don't, yeah, we don't see how, what kind of technology really was a lifesaver in those days. Well, it was a lifesaver, but it also changed how, you know, the entire structure. And, and I think what makes Mark Twain so interesting is he was, as, you, as we all know, I mean, he's, he's a majorly popular world author, at, almost to the point where you think, wait a minute, you guys like Mark Twain more than we do. Maybe you read him more than we do. I was so struck by that in Russia, how many people knew Mark Twain far better than I did. Uh, it's almost embarrassing, you know, if you think about it. You think, oh, wait a minute, you know. Um, I don't want to... I don't want to act like an ignorant person, but no, I haven't read that particular short story by Mark Twain. You apparently have, you know. But um, he was writing at a time, if you think about it, where he was really seeing these changes. And he starts in Hannibal, Missouri. And I don't know if you all have been there, but it's, it is just like you'd imagine it, right? This, you know, a Mississippi River town, uh, not the southern side of the Mississippi, which is what I always thought about, but where you get snow, you know, um, and you see how he grew up. The house is still there. Every the houses where the adventures happen. There's you can just see all of these things happening in his childhood, and to think that he's going to become a world traveler, world renowned in his lifetime, an 
icon, talking about cultural icons, a, a superhero. Um, today there would be, and you know, there probably are awards named after him, I don't even know it, but in his own lifetime there would have been, you know, literary awards probably if it would have been today, he'd have probably had his own museum and I can't even think what he would have had. He'd have his own, I know, his own cable channel. That's what he would have had. But, you know, just, just this magnificent force um, of humor and yet he started a little boy running around barefoot right there in Hannibal. I think that's sort of extraordinary American kind of story. Right. The the ground that he covered too was was pretty amazing. I I watched a, a pretty good documentary on his life and uh, you know, we, we think of him around uh around the the Mississippi there, but he really he really made some some distance there. He traveled out west and you know, so he Europe overseas, yeah. 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 Um well, well, going to uh, I, you, I think it's close. Th oh, I'm sorry. Pardon? You you guys filmed? Oh, no, I was just gonna. Didn't you? We did. We went to Hannibal. We were close by, and we said, "Oh my gosh, you know how you do." You say we're only a okay. Well, we're so crazy. We say, "Oh, we're only a couple hundred miles from <laughs> from Hannibal," you know. And then we think, and we think we can't do that. And then we think, wait a minute, when are we ever going to be near Hannibal again? You know. So we had to do it, and um, we've done that with a lot of things, and we. I'm just so glad we did. It's always so wonderful when you can be in the exact, if, if the houses, the, the, you know, if you can actually walk the same floors as these people that are uh, authors or statesmen, it just, I just think there's nothing better. And I know a lot of families sacrifice a lot to take their children to historical sites. And maybe it's only something so-called small or close by, but listen, that's what kids remember from their education when they're kids. They don't, they're they not going to remember, you know, the, the grammatical exercise or their math homework. They're going to remember that trip. You know, it's it's a very fine thing to do. I know you all do it in your family when you can. I know that. Well, we try. Yeah, that's, that's my fault, I guess. Uh, but yes, I, I've been known to, uh, oh, here, let's go off on this exit, you know, because of this. Marking. I love the the fact that they put it on the on the highways. You know the big brown sign that says you know Mark Twain's home and you know things like that. Because otherwise they wouldn't hit they wouldn't hit me like mm -hmm. that. I wouldn't be thinking oh I'm passing by you know where Mark Twain grew up. But that that's a good idea for another class or another uh, documentary. There is Professor Carroll's side trips. You know. We could just have videos of all your stuff. Yeah, yeah, there are. Well, um, there have been some interesting ones. And, you know, then you start down the road and you go, okay, well, we thought it was only 20 miles. Okay, it's 45 miles. Well, now what are we doing? <laughs> the great American dilemma. But, you know, it's, it is kind of an American dilemma. And I think tw it's that spirit. I mean, Twain really captured it. His little pithy remarks. There's a reason why they've stayed in our humor. But, you know, he was a kind of a mean guy too when he didn't like something when he was aggressive against it I don't know how many of the uh, the we don't really usually read those essays sometimes but you know he waste let's say he spared no words uh, mm -hmm. so you wanted to be on the right side of Mark Twain <laughs> you know that's probably something to think about wow. so what else can we think about as we hang out here in Google well I just I don't have a transition for it I just kind of have a list of things that you go on uh, in this session and one of them is I know from many conversations that you're really fond of the Library of Congress okay first no. of all, how can somebody be fond of a Library of Congress and I want you to explain that to me well how can you not be because it's our national library and we all pay taxes yeah. for it uh, you know, the Library of Congress, especially all those years when I was teaching the uh, a grad bibliography class at SMU in the music master's program, and they, this is the kind of program you have to take in a master's or a doctoral program where you just work on music bibliography and techniques of manuscript reading and some kind of tough stuff, kind of, you know, it's usually shocking to everybody. It was to me when I first took it. But um, you begin to understand that national libraries have played a big role in European and in non-European uh, parts of the world. The National Library has been this energy, energizing force for collecting and preserving the culture. And we come to it late in America. You know, think of European countries where they've had um, libraries that go back centuries and centuries. So our National Library was was founded in the late 
you know, when our country was founded, and it was meant to be a legislator's tool. So the initial collection for the Library of Congress was things like um, almanacs and um, nautical books and books on agriculture and books on, um, uh, you know, other countries' constitutions for the lawmakers and law codes from other countries and tools for legislators. And the Library of Congress still has that absolute, you know, they have that massive department for legislative research and congressional people and other governmental people are constantly calling the Library of Congress or sending their aides, you know, back and forth, find out about this. Well, what was the toma canned tomato production in such and such place in 1953? Well, somebody's got to know that, you know, and that's the kind of work the Library of Congress is always doing or how many, uh, you know, I didn't even, you know, how many roads up this kind of mountain to this kind of, I mean, all of this kind of information that's important to lawmakers, right? But in, there was a big shift in the Library of Congress when we uh, sort of had the whole thing burned down, you know, in that little war between the Brits and, you know, that, that little 1812 thing that happened, right? And uh, the Library of Congress was, was burned up, you know, uh, which we don't think about it, and they had to start over again, and that's when Thomas Jefferson sold not donated, it's very important, he sold at a decent price, not a high price, but not a low price, he sold his collection of books, most of it, a lot of it, to the new Library of Congress. And why this is so important, I'm giving a long, I don't want to do the whole course, but it, 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 Jefferson had all those things that you need as a, a state manager, legislator's tool, you know, he had all that interest, obviously, but he had books on art, books on music, books on philosophy, literature, French, you know, he was such a cultured man. And it set the Library of Congress going in a very new direction that was like most European countries' national libraries. And from that point on, the Library of Congress became this great vacuum cleaner that sucked up every publication it could get, including things published abroad, but definitely things published in this country. And so back now to the American Memory Project, it was these prescient, visionary saints, if I may, bibliographical saints, if I may, um, who saw in the early 19th century particularly I mean, sorry, early 20th century, the need to start collecting Americana, not just things that were published here, but to start focusing on collections of what we might call folk materials. Um, and then there's a kind of a break, a, a, a focus on, and, and of course the other great institution is the Smithsonian. There's a group where clearly, yes, we're doing dinosaur bones and we're doing, um, you know, rocks from things from Egypt or whatever we can get that's world archaeological or portraits, a national portrait gallery, all of it. But we also want to get American folk instruments and we also want to get um, things that, you know, that American ad advertisements and um, I can't even think of things, soap boxes from, you know, the 19 whatevers so that we have examples of our popular American culture. So between the way the Smithsonian has collected and the Library of Congress has collected, this Americana is just rich in both institutions. So, almost done, <laughs> in the 19 early, as computer technology moved along, the problem with Library of Congress, Paul, and the reason you're not in love with it is you haven't spent a lot of time hanging out there. You need to do your Google Hangouts, you know, and, and, yeah. and in the reading room, and, and it's just so amazing. And there's four buildings, five buildings, just so incredible, plus lots of storage warehouses. I think how many miles, I should have those quotes in the top of my head, and I don't, how many miles of shelving at the Library of Congress. You could, you could go, you don't want to know how far you can go, way more more than a bunch of tanks of gas would get you. So um, all this is to say that when they began to realize the prospects for digital technology, they began digitalizing a lot of their Americana, and that's the American Memory Project. And the American Memory Project brought online, certainly not all of it, but some very interesting collections of American, for example, sheet music from the 19th century, Civil War ballads, uh, theater uh, placards or posters, and, you know, that would have been important around the the vaudeville area, things on Native Americans that were, uh, you would, you know, to see the stuff you would have had to go, and now you can click and read the text and see the pictures, and really it's as if you, again, had a private collection that you could walk into. It's marvelous for kids' homework, it's marvelous to explore um, the, um, the Gershwin collection, you know, I mean, there's just so many things that are at the Library of Congress not only worldwide but American and that's where that American Memory Project is a gateway to a lot of materials. That was one long paragraph, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, but okay. you know, you that is your national library and because of digital technology we don't have to go there all the time to get it. We can really access an enormous amount of it now from our homes. 
Well, I can not probably quite. guarantee you, I'm not going. You won't find me there reading nautical charts, but I will. You know, as per your recommendation, we actually have a comment from from one of our viewers, from Jane, who says she went there on your recommendation, and their family enjoyed it and now sees the benefits of it. So, you know, yay! You have a witness there. <laughs> well, it's it's a. I have a witness. Thank you. Well, yeah, it's a beautiful place. I mean, the the actual physical building of the the one with the dome. It's right behind Congress. The dome, uh, the inside of the reading room, the decor, the marble, the statue. Because we finally opened the new uh, Jefferson Building. I think it was 1897. I believe is the date. I have to double check that, but I think that's right. Um, it was a national event that America finally had a regal palatial uh, national library to which heads of state all over the world sent gifts, mosaics and paintings and you know vases and I mean it's it, we finally joined the world in terms of having this kind of a palatial structure. It's very important on that level too. It's it, and and you know when you go to Washington, you got to go see the space. You got to go to this, and you got to do this, and you. Most people never get to the Library of Congress, so I'm always telling people, go to the Library of Congress. It's a free tour. They do it, I think, two or three times a day. It won't be crowded, and unless your kids are really toddlers, they're going to be impressed by it. I think. Um, go, 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 go. Okay. Please. All right. Okay. Enough of that. I'm sorry. I got a little carried away. Library of Congress. List. Library of Congress. I do believe you. Okay. Okay. Well, okay, so you mentioned the inventor, Emil Berliner. What's the, um, what's the significance? Oh, yeah, and see, that's another, you can access a lot of Berliner materials with the Library of Congress. Oh, see, you know, that's the thing, and, and we get into this unit, and I don't want to do too much with this, because if you start looking at this whole issue of who gets credit for inventions, this is hot-button stuff. This is stuff that, um, oh, you yeah. know, t you probably know. Are you a fan of inventions, Paul? Do you follow any well, of that? Well, Definitely, but I mean, it, it's the specifically the Tesla and Edison thing is the stuff of legend, and it is it's big these days. You know, I'm I've just received two or three weeks ago, an a press release of a you know of a new graphic novel about Tesla, and there's this whole um, movie behind it, and it is pretty intriguing. It, it, he has that story is not simple about what really went on in his life, and we'll just say to our viewers, we're not going there, in, in <laughs> not in a bad sense, but it, it's very complicated. And what happened? Yeah. And you know, at his death, and he was impoverished. He had created, uh, you know, if you look at it from the Tesla standpoint, practically every direction that's in our modern technology, you know, radar and uh, things that have taken rocket ships to the moon, and certainly we know his inventions in, you know, things like elect electric inventions and his role in, in sound reproduction. It, it, it. He was the genius, and yet his life did not work out that way, did it? At least part of it, and then he ends up terribly, and then all this kind of funny stuff happens to his materials when he dies, right? Is that what the novel was dealing with? Yes, yes. Um, you know, I, did, I didn't read it. I just got the press release and, and looked at a little uh, trailer that they gave me, but, uh, you know, I mean, there's movies out there. It just seems to be on the, and of course, the, the, the car, the electric car is called the Tesla, you know, that they put out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, there's there's just quite a, you know, if you go on you, YouTube and just just you know type in Tesla, you will see all kinds of stuff about him. So, or it's just, but for me, I don't think I heard yeah. of it until I was probably in high school. Some of it's a little over the edge too, but you can pick through it, you know. Right. Sure. Well, um, Berliner was well, and and Emil Berliner, who is not nearly. He was, he was not the controversy of Tesla. You know, Tesla is a really uh, cloak and dagger kind of story. Really. I mean, really. If your kids like cloak and dagger and inventions, and this is Tesla. Berliner was just a little bit behind in some respects, depending on how you look at it, uh, chronologically to Edison. But Berliner was right on about the flat disk technology for recording. And his experiments and his inventions and his patents and his recording studio, or not studio, but company, they're doing flat disk. And we all know flat disk won out over cylinders, right? Most of us don't have you know, any LPs or DV, uh, CDs on on a round cylinder, you know? So uh, Berliner was right about that being the, the optimal way to record sound on a flat disc. Okay, so. let me ask you, what 
in in your recollection, do you remember any type of uh, players that that your family had? I mean, what did you listen to when you were a kid? Oh well, we all had in my generation. We had this little suitcase that played the seventy eights and forty fives, you know. And only right. grown ups had thirty three. But see, thirty threes don't even come out to what I said, nineteen forty eight. So you gonna I think that may I have to see I have to rush up on these dates. Sorry, I haven't thought about them in a long time. I used to teach a unit on uh, all the uh, dates of recording technology, uh, but it, 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 it does slip some. But yeah. I think it's about then that you get the LP, the long play, the 33 and a third rotation per minute, and so it goes slower, so you can get more on it, so it's longer. But um, did you grow up with a little box? Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. I had I had the little box with mostly the 45s, but the you know the larger ones would fit on there. But no, I just I mean even my uncle it shows how old I am, but my my uncle had a a leftover uh, player that used the disc, you know, that used the c cylinder. A cylinder player. Did it work yeah. still, and you got to hear it? Right. No, I didn't get to hear it. I was just what is this? Oh, that's what you know. That's what we had stuff on, you know, when I was little, and you know that type thing. But yeah, I don't even know if it worked. But uh, I just now you got to try to find it. Cylinder what? and thinking how how does this play? You know. Yeah, as a kid, you went, what is it? Right. Well, we have a 1921 uh, Victor gramophone. We we bought it about maybe 15 years ago, and we always love to play it for students because it's um I mean it's you know it's a it's it, the horn is internalized so it looks like a really pretty piece of furniture, uh like a uh side ta a tall side not a side table a tall skinny pretty console it's console that's the word I want <laughs> it doesn't have the horn coming out because we didn't get one of those but yeah. um, so the horn actually is worked into the furniture so you open these doors and out comes the sound and it's amazing how loud and what good quality is and of course you just crank it up you know and it plays it plays 15 or so minutes on a good crank you know and p kids are just fascinated by it. they want to find the plug there is no plug um, so you know that technology was terrific except there's all the things it wouldn't record you know how do you get a symphony orchestra down a horn how do you get a chorus to sing into a horn? Even if you put out 20 or 30 horns, balancing the sound, you couldn't mix sound. You could, it was all done acoustically, and it was very complicated technology. So they didn't. I, the, the first time anybody recorded an actual symphony orchestra was 1913. They did a Beethoven, I think it's, I can't remember, it's the fifth or the, I believe it may have been. Uh, the complete because you know then you only had three minutes on a on a cylinder or three minutes on a disc. So think how many think how many uh, of those you need. And do you remember seeing those Paul where somebody would have like a you know five inch thick and it was heavy or not maybe five four and it would be one act of an opera or something or a symphony movement and it took eight discs. Do you remember those things? Yes, yes. My my uncle referring again to my uncle, he had tons of them. Yeah, I mean they were they were real luxuries. Of course, you didn't have 800 recordings. You had a small number, and you played them over and over and over and over, and, you, and then you shared them with your friends, and they shared theirs. And it, boy, these recordings were so precious and special. Mm -hmm. And of course, now people have shelves of them, and they never listen to them. And then they have iTunes, 18,000 right. songs on iTunes, and you're going to listen to 18,000 songs when? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, um, so what kind of you make me think about what kind of things were were first recorded? I mean, and and when did it become a like? I know that I'm sure when the cylinder came out and they said, "Hey, we can we've got music." Who could afford it? Well, actually, and that's an important thing. And I, I mentioned this in the class session for this course in American America's Artistic Legacy, which our Circle of Scholars members uh, take. You know, it wasn't the the first thing they thought about was not music; it was voices. And I remember learning that in that same bibliography class, by the way, as a grad student long ago go in the 70s. Uh, I never thought about it. Uh, I remember my parents had some 78s with speeches on it and I thought that was kind of weird um, because it's not by the time I'm a kid in the 50s you're not buying records for speeches. You know, Maybe comedy routines. They were kind of popular for adults in the 50s when I was a kid. But uh, the, the, the idea that was so wonderful you know, it goes back to Edison's Mary Had a Little Lamb, if you want. But the idea is now we can capture our fame, our president's voices, our industrial uh, leaders and our politicians and our great uh, poets' voices. And we could have, uh, we could have uh, our, you know, our authors reading their own works. The idea was the voice. 
And then they became used very early on to very early on for commercials. And I don't really know how this all worked out, but there's a lot of early commercials recorded on these things, and they are like the funniest. I like to play them for the grad students because it would be the old, I mean, because this form comes out of vaudeville and it continues on for a long, we still get it sometimes in advertisements. So it would be the, uh, oh, I can't begin to do it. I'm not crazy enough right now to do it. I should try, but so your, so your tummy is upset. So what have you done for your tummy? Well, let's look at this Dr. Dr. Seuss, not Dr. Seuss, Dr. Vakovich's tummy medication. No, we don't mean just any tummy medication. You know, it goes on and on. Take Dr. Vakovich is not Dr. Doo -doo -doo, and it would go on and there'd be this carnival barker's voice and you'd have three minutes of and in the course of it you'd hear Dr. Vakovich's tummy medication 70 times. In fact, we did that once with one, I can't remember what it was we were listening to from a Berliner collection of uh, that had been redone on DVDs and I would put it on sometimes in class. We'd just sit back and listen and crack up. It was interesting, you know. Um, and I think the name of the product, whatever it was, baking, it was a baking powder. It was a Baking powder. I bet anybody who took that class 40 years later will still remember it. And the name of the baking powder is probably said in three minutes, or not even three minutes, two minutes and 20 seconds. It's probably said about 40 times. <laughs> I don't know, 35 times. And that was branding back then, you see. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it music came after. Music had its own technological co and nobody remember people went to hear music live and they made music and they played music and they sang music and they played in community bands and they they sang at church and they you know you didn't need to go to some piece of physical technology to hear music that's not what music was great point great point and I and we've lost a lot of that I mean it's, it's not common these days and more and more even schools are having to get rid of their music programs. Yeah, wow. Great point. Well, and I'm and and I have to admit I'm one of those people. I'm one of those people who who took the bare minimal in music. I, I play no instruments and so the uh, the iPod, you know, becomes my <laughs> instrument of choice. Uh, you know. Are we going to let you stay? I don't know what we're going to do about you. We may have to send you to music therapy. <laughs> I know. You, you know, like at least give me a harmonica or something, and and, yeah. make, and make me play something before before I come to the next class. I don't know, but you know, we're that's the next section that we're getting into as far as as this class is the arrangements, and you know. That's stuff that just blows me away, you know, just the idea of musical arrangements and how, how you keep track of it and the combinations and how, yeah. what kind of role did this play in, in the 19th and 20th centuries is, is the building these arrangements. Well, we're very persnickety about it today. We think everything has to be exact, but we forget that uh, up until really the early 1600s, people wouldn't even specify. By, well, you never knew what the court or the castle down the road was going to have in the way of, instru of, of instruments. And one of the first pieces uh, to actually to specify which, is, uh, which instrument plays what is Monteverdi's Orfeo, I believe 1607, I believe is right. I should rethink my dates, but I think that's right. Where in the score, it, because the assumption would be you would have, say, five part writing or, or four parts or six parts, and, it, and you would make your sopranos, like if you had flutes or if you had a, a, some kind of a, a reed instrument, and then you'd put your deeper strings in the middle or whatever you had. You know, you would, you would your chest of vials, as they were called in Renaissance times, and you'd just make it all work. And Monteverdi actually writes out it, what the parts will be, you know, which instrument is playing which part. I mean, this was now, and that didn't even become standard behavior for a long time. And even in the Baroque, there was an assumption that you'd have an ensemble, and the, the conductor or the players would figure out, oh, okay, it's a soprano line, alto line, we'll do this. I'll put the the viola on this. I mean, there was indication, of course. It settles in, but it's it takes it a couple hundred years, you know, because there was that assumption of standard uh, instruments being available for certain things. That 
just takes hundreds of years. Now we're, you know, a, a brass band has this in it, a jazz band has this in it, an orchestra has this in it, a wind band has this in it, but that takes a long, 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 long time. And and meanwhile, the whole theory of you play any old piece and make it work any way you can was what, how people heard music. So if you had a piano and you were in, you'd heard from your girlfriend who got to go to St. Louis and she got to hear, um, she got to go to a vaudeville show or she got to go to a some kind of Sunday afternoon community concert with some fancy ladies were there and there was this really wonderful song and this really whatever and she bought the sheet music before she came back from St. Louis. So you if you have a pump organ you're going to play it on the pump organ. If you have a guitar you're going to try to play it on the guitar. If you have a piano you're going to play it on the piano. You know if there's four of your friends over you all are going to turn it and harmonize it into a quartet spontaneously by just putting harmonies in and then if somebody has a flute or somebody had a trumpet people would just make music work out based on the means they had and that was true at the concert level too and in that assignment as a kind of symbol of this we have a Gottschalk piece that I mean, you can find this several different ways that I have assigned um, to listen to in three different very different arrangements and and I think it really um, it's a very musical experience to hear things done in different combinations of instruments and, and different combinations of instruments with voices uh, and it's how music spread. It's just, you just got to think about these little arrangements just running all around like like you, you know, like little mice running all over the country. You know? yeah. And people made it work and they enjoyed it. I mean, it was, it, nothing was set in stone. The whole point was that you came to know the pieces and you were able to play them with whatever forces you had. And some combinations were bombastic and some combinations were more domestic and, and you know, you didn't go and push your iPod. <laughs> it yeah. didn't. You know, Right. You know, we seem to be uh, less expecting for an artist to have a well-rounded uh, bag of talent, so to speak. We, you know, we talked about um, vaudeville a while back, and a few few lessons ago, was it? And and you know, somebody could come out, and he was a good singer, he was a good player, he was a good actor, he was a good juggler. You know, it was like almost like he had to do all of these things. But now, I, it's just my observation. It doesn't seem that we're we're we don't we don't tolerate that these days. It seems like when an actor, you know, we find out they can sing, we just uh, you know, every now and then they might have a hit or something like that. But there are very few people that are these. You know, we call them Renaissance people. You know, Renaissance man or something. If he has more than one talent, but does that make sense? Is that well, yeah? Is that way. Your, your, your Gene Kellys and your Judy Garlands and you know that that was really the last generation where everybody could do a lot. You know, they were expected to dance, to sing, to play an instrument. Because think how many of those movies from the 40s and the 30s, once you get into the talkies after the late 20s, you know, they, the, the main character could sit down and play the piano or pick up a string bass or pick up a trumpet and play it and sing and they were expected to dance. You know, you're right. I mean, now the expectation is it's, it's uh, extraordinary if we find out somebody can play four chords at the piano. Um, and that's... And, you know, talents... Tend to, people who are talented musically are often talented artistically and you know dance and painting and drawing. It's they're not isolated little you know. It's not like oh I've got a green thread through me I can only paint you know or oh, I can only throw pots and do ceramics I couldn't possibly sing you know. Uh, yeah I agree we're very compartmentalized and uh, we don't expect our people and we probably don't even want them as you say. I bet you there's a lot of talent in entertainment today where people are really told not to let people find out that they're very good at, oh, I don't know what, whatever it is. Right. I don't know how that works. Maybe someone knows how that works. Well, but you you're know, right. It's not expected. I know, you know, one of my favorites, Steve Martin, and he, you know, he became popular for stuff that, you know, kind of came later in his career, but at the beginning it was very vaudevillian. He's a great um, uh, musician and songwriter and you know he he cuts CDs but the only people that buy them nowadays are people like me you know uh, just, you know it's just because I'll buy just about anything you know because I, I see him as a genius but that's that that's another subject but um, if I, I so no, no, that, that's good and you well, we're going to be talking about Gilville in the next couple of lessons. I'm trying to think where we are with it, but it's already up, coming up. And we, you don't really lose vaudeville because vaudeville still influences our late Saturday night programs. It influences our pageants. It 
influences our humor. Um, so we don't lose that. The difference is we don't expect as much as you say. Yeah, it's it's still it's still in our entertainment even if we don't realize it. Um, I took us off course, and and I really don't know much about Dvorak. So can you tell me what you would like us to take away for this class about him? Well, we talk. I talk about him in this unit because of the big thing that when he came to the United States for just a few years was brought here at a fantastic salary to give validity to uh, a wonderful woman, uh, Thurber, who was was trying to create a first class, world class conservatory in New York, um, and did what we all do. You know, you try to hire someone well known, famous to come and break. It's like going out and recruiting for sports teams. You want the best. And Dvorak was a very, very popular Czech composer. I know you I know you're fond of Czech culture, Paul. I know I know some people you ran around with with a camera with in Prague. Let's see, who could that be? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm still a little you worn better... out from that. It's two years ago. Oh yeah. Paul could tell you all stories. He's behaving always with this, but when we take Paul out on uh, filming trips with us, it's um well we try to tell him he better rest up because nobody sleeps on these and now he you know, he believes us now. <laughs> I do. I don't know how you do it, but it's it's great. Well, it, it is exciting, but you know, Dvorak was a superstar by the time he came here, and why he's really important. And I and, and I'm actually going to read since you brought it up. I'm I, I just in case we got to that topic. Let's see. Actually, I brought this wonderful anthology I've I've made reference to in the course. I'll show the picture of it. I think it'll come up if we have pictures. Yes. Um, music called Music in the USA. Look how big this is. Isn't this wonderful? Music in the USA, and it's an anthology by Judith Tick. Uh, who uh, basically she's taken what I it's what I, one of my favorite kinds of books it's a source readings book that means there's documents um, whether they're newspaper articles magazine articles concert reviews personal letters I'm trying to you know advertisements everything you can think of diary entries and so they're the actual uh, stuff of of events and it's arranged chronologically for the history of American music and and I love these kind of books in any whether it's art history or politics or, or uh, religious history, and Dvorak was exposed to spirituals through uh, a man named Henry Burley, who later was going to become a very important arranger of uh, the spiritual as an art song. He was a singer, he was um, a free black in uh, New York, and he was extremely um, important for Dvorak because Dvorak had never heard these melodies, these spirituals from you know the southern slave spirituals which we talk about uh, in the unit or have talked about I, forget where, I think it was the previous unit. I can't remember where all the units go. I'm sorry, guys, but it's in there. I promise. And and he was so amazed by this music. So he um, he basically said what what others have said. You you Americans, you keep imitating Beethoven and Brahms and and Mendelssohn, and look what you've got for your own folk music. Remember, late 19th century. Everybody in Europe and increasingly in America, but particularly in Europe, they are so tuned in to their folk music. They see modern technology taking away the uh, rural life. They see trains. They see the telegraph, the telephone, the pho photography. They see all these intrusions on the village life, and they know it's just a matter of time before the younger generations all go to the city, which happened, and the old way of life is dissolved. And so they try to capture the folk poetry and the folk songs. That's Bartok, it's Kodai, it's Percy Granger, it's it's a whole lot of people doing it from different places. Dvorak's looking around saying, you guys have this culture of spirituals, among other things, and you're not using it in your composition. And he called them Negro melodies. And so what he wrote, and this is such a... Um, I, if I can find this quote, and I had it marked. I see whenever you have something marked, that's always the first mistake, isn't it? Oh, I know which uh, one it is. It's let's see. That looks like the kind um, of book that somebody who likes going to the Library of Congress might read. <laughs> there is that. Okay. I re well, there is that too. But I'm telling you. Oh, I found it. I, I'm telling you, the source readings are really good because I'll tell you the trick, and I used to say this to students too. If you can follow a source readings book, let's say it's on uh, the American Revolutionary War, okay? If you can follow the excerpts and kind of know where it all sort of kind of fits, then you know your topic, okay? I mean, that's it because you're getting like um, vignettes. You're almost getting like a little telescope, you know, where if right. you plop down on this, this thing. Okay, I found this. He, he's, this is called Dr. Dvorak 
this sounds funny, doesn't it, Dr. Dvorak? Finds in them the basis, the, Negro, the real value of Negro melodies, finds in them the basis for an American school of music rich in undeveloped themes. And then it goes on and says, uh, American composers are urged to study plantation songs and build upon them. And in the text it says, and this is what Dvorak said in an interview, basically, um, I am, and I'm trying to think to whom he was speaking. I'd have to look, but uh, somebody, uh, I won't look now. Um, he said, I am now satisfied that the future music of this country, of America, must be founded upon what are called Negro melodies. This must be the real foundation of any serious and original school of composition to be developed in the United States. When I first came here last year, I was impressed with this idea, and it has developed into a settled conviction. These beautiful and varied themes are the product of the soil. They are American. I would like to trace out the traditional authorship of the Negro melody, for it would throw a great deal of light upon the question I am most deeply interested in at the present. And the fruit of all that is his New World Symphony, and for most people that Largo melody uh, that's in that slow movement that goes to which we think of as a classic classical symphonic melody, but as of course it is a Negro melody, it is an American spiritual. So, you know, that one, we were, we still are in America, but we really were sort of going, tell us what we're doing is important, and Dvorak told us, and it meant a lot to a lot of people for decades thereafter. That's great. So, uh, so it took someone from outside to kind of give us a, a, a clue, hey, what you got here is great, you got to check this out. And does that not always happen? Think about how often that happens in our life, even with our children. You know, we can say to them, oh, you look so cute, and that hair looks, and it has to be someone, someone else saying it. You know, we have to hear it from someone else always, or we don't think it's valid. And in terms of art and culture, it's European endorsement of what we're doing in America that really will add solidity and conviction, as he called it, a solid conviction, and kind of give us the confidence we need to take off in our own American directions. Mm. Wow. Well, I think we're going to be wrapping this up. Yeah, we better. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're, we got a lot of topics in, though, didn't we? I think we covered plenty. I think so. It's, it's, a, great, uh, it's a great course and, and good material. I have note that next class we're going to be talking more about the Gilded Age, and it mirrored so much about the luxury at the end of the 19th century in Europe. And so... Are you going to give us a little teaser on that, or are we going to find out why? In well, the you know, if you've got a Tiffany lamp or an imitation knockoff Tiffany lamp, which a lot of us have, you know, or if you uh, have brocade in your house or, uh, you know, any of those drapes that have the little, what do you call it, the fringes, you know, coming down, um, or if you have, you know, overstuffed uh, chairs from your aunt's, uh, great aunt's house that's, you know, in your, up in your attic, you've got some reflections of the Gilded Age in style. But, yeah, you know, that's an interesting time period we're going to be getting into where enormous wealth, enormous wealth is being accumulated in this country. And for the first time, we're going to be palace builders. The way the czars were, the way the monarchs were, we haven't been palace builders in this country. And there's going to be a stratum of Americans who are going to have the money to build. They're going to be called mansions, you know, or, um, you know, they've got all kinds of names. But they are small palatial structures that indicate a whole new direction for American popular culture in that line of people who can afford to do it and all the industry that will build up again trying to supply these luxury goods, the luxury goods market, this is when it develops. It's coming. Wow. All right. Well, thank you so much, Professor Carroll. Uh, to those of you, thank you for joining us here on America's Artistic Legacy, this being the section New Technologies and Gilded Age.